All right. So today uh, we want to uh, move, if we you want, uh, deeper uh, into uh, control theory. We already covered what I think is three key uh, points that were absolutely necessary uh, to cover before moving anywhere. <clears throat> First, we covered models, right? right? Especially linear models, state space. Then we covered concept of stability. We understood what stability means. And then we understood what control means. Like, what does it mean to design a control? What is a control? What is a control input? How it can be used to stabilize the system? Those three are fun, uh, foundational blocks for control theory. You have to know those things in order to move forward. Now we know them, and we can move to one of the um, oldest and most respected parts of control theory, which is uh, not only respected, but also to a fair degree uh, useful and uh, illuminating. So uh, today, Laplace, Laplace transform and transfer functions. Before I start uh, introducing them, just a couple of words uh, why you may want to learn this, right? And what it what it is in relation to the rest of the course. So Laplace transform historically had been pretty much the entire control theory. Uh, state space representation that we studied in the first lecture and that we used actively last two, last three lectures is a relatively new phenomenon. I'm not saying that it was invented recently. It, people knew how to write matrices for a very long time. But usually the entire control theory course, textbook, engineering practice could be run without it. Instead, people were using what, what we call transfer functions or uh, frequency domain representation, Laplace domain representation. We will, un we will understand this uh, within this lecture, what it means. So historically, uh, it wasn't what you studied for the past three lectures that was used. It was what you are going to study today that was used. Okay. That is why a lot of material, uh, especially stuff that is from the 80s and early, would be written entirely in terms of Laplace transform. And even a lot of modern textbooks and a lot of modern courses would operate with some use of Laplace transform. There are some concepts which simply cannot be easily covered in state space form, but easily done in, La in uh, Laplace transform. One of those, Bode plot, we will study next week. So first of all, if you want to connect to older textbooks and material, you need this language. And second, there are some useful things which can only be done in this way. Okay, that is the idea. Okay, why people did it this way? I hope I will be able to <clears throat> explain a little bit uh, during the lecture. All right, now let us uh, start. Let us start. All right, so before we go into control theory, we need to remember what Laplace transform is, uh, what Laplace transform is. Let me use annotation. So Laplace transform of a function f of t, right? so function of time, f of t, its Laplace transform is um, this integral on the right-hand side of this equality. Right? So integral from zero to infinity over f of t times this, what we can call uh, Laplace transform kernel, kernel, okay? This is a exponent, uh, exponential to the power minus s t. Right? The integral is taken over time, right? So from zero to infinity over time. And this, this free variable s remains after you're done uh, after you're done with the Laplace transform, it becomes your new variable. Time, as you can uh, easily notice, will disappear. Right, time, time, and time. Right, all of this is integration variable. After you're done integrating, you substitute zero, you substitute infinity, you find the difference, 
and the time is away. You you no longer have have time after you're done with Laplace transform. Instead, you have a new variable s. This new variable s is in fact a complex variable. Right? It's a complex number. It has a real part. It has it has an imaginary part. If you studied any integral transformations of a similar type, you might feel it is familiar. The one transformation that people usually study that is uh, quite similar is Fourier transformation. So Fourier transformation would be very similar, except here, instead of complex variable S, you would have a frequency uh, variable. <laughs> so it would be I omega, I mean, roughly speaking. OK. okay. This is not part of the course, but I will just give you a two-word explanation of what, what is going on here. In fact, you can think of this as a decomposition in the same way as a Fourier transform is a decomposition. If you remember what Fourier transform is, it is uh, decomposing a signal along frequencies, continuous frequencies. Right? You can think of it as decomposing signal into sinusoids, <laughs> but not discreetly, like Fourier series but continuously. It gives you a spectrum of the signal, continuous spectrum. This does exact same thing, except instead of a frequencies, it decomposes into solutions of the second order ODEs. Right? So you can think of a Laplace transform as decomposing uh, the signal into solution of first and second order ODEs. And it is also a continuous spectrum, but in terms of kind of ODE solutions. So whereas uh, for, for Fourier transform, it makes no sense to talk about uh, convergence or something like this. If we, sinusoids don't change their amplitude. Here you can talk, uh, talk about both frequency and convergence. Right? Okay, all right. That you don't need to, to uh, know this part uh, in this course. I just want to sort of give you an idea. All right, study of Laplace transform is uh, entire field. You can find a course just on Laplace transform. Uh, MIT has a course on YouTube if you're interested. And uh, it is developed for its application of solving ordinary differential equations. <clears throat> so what Laplace transform allows you to do is essentially transform an ODE into Laplace form and then solve it very easily on a piece of paper without uh, using uh, complicated formulas from you know, what you studied, hopefully, in your uh, differential equation uh, class. Instead, it makes it much, much simpler. Uh, it has other applications, of course, not just uh, how to solve ODEs by hand. But yeah, historically, it was developed uh, in many ways for that. It was the age before computers. Before computers came, uh, it was easier to solve ODEs using Laplace transform. We're not going to cover this whole thing. We're going to use only one case out of all uh, Laplace transforms. Only one case we're going to use. Mm -hmm. So we're going to transform exactly one function out of this whole uh, big area of possible transformations. We're going to transform one function. In fact, we're going to transform a derivative that might be surprising. We're going to transform a derivative. Let us look into it. So here is a derivative, dx dt, dx dt. And we're going, we want to find its uh, Laplace uh, transform, Laplace transform of this uh, function. So uh, here is how we're going to denote it. Uh, so L of dx dt, that is uh, Laplace transform of uh, dx dt. L, like this curly A, L is uh, calligraphic L, how we call it, is uh, just a denotation that we are taking Laplace transformation of something. All right. So we are going to uh, transform it, and we know how to do it. It is integral from 0 to infinity over the function we are going to transform dx dt times kernel. Kernel goes uh, is e to the power uh, 
minus st, same as before, over dt. Right? How do we take this integral? Well, uh, it is very easy to take it using integration by parts, integration by parts. Let's, let me remind you what integration by, far, by parts is. So it says, if you have an integral over v times du dt and over dt, right? So v u dot dt, it is the same as v times u minus dv dt u dt. Kind of interesting, kind of interesting. Uh, you, you, if you don't remember this formula or somehow it feels to you uh, like magic comes out of nowhere, just consider the fact that you can transfer this to the left-hand side. And then you have multiplication here and uh, v u dot plus v dot u, uh, v dot u, right? Uh, equals to integral over that equals to v times u. If you differentiate both parts, we have a derivative of a multiplication, so kind of standard. So it's this formula should not be very strange to me. Okay, now let us uh, consider how we are going to use this formula to work with this guy. So first, dx dt we denote it as du dt. <clears throat> So here is the uh, I will try to color code everything so it is easier for you to follow what uh, happens. Okay. So this is going to be du dt. Okay. And uh, okay, Th this is not part of the final uh, final question. It's just a, um, a part of the original question, right? V is this guy, right? the kernel. So the kernel is V. Okay. Now we need to find two other things. One is what is U. U if uh, du dt is dx dt, then U is x. So you need to, to put U here, right? So x, right? And we forgot to put uh, v, which is, we said, is kernel, also here, right? So is v. Okay. Now what is remaining is dv dt. So we integrate, we differentiate the kernel. And what we have is uh, uh, minus s times the kernel, minus s times e to the power minus st. All right, that's just der derivative over exponential. All right, deal with whole explanation. Um, we put it here, we put it here. And uh, we also need to put one additional element, namely this u here, right? That's it, that's it. I think uh, it uh, now it is clear what, what happened uh, in the equation form, right? How we got uh, equation form. But now let us consider uh, a few interesting uh, facts. First of all, this guy here, this guy here, is uh, a, a, uh, should be evaluated at zero and, and at infinity. So at zero, um, let me use uh, arrows, x would become x of zero. Right? And you would have minus sign because s is a lower limit so it would be okay and uh this guy at zero becomes one so kernel at zero becomes one because uh, e to the power minus s zero is e to the power zero is one okay now what happens when you do the same but at uh, at infinity at infinity this guy becomes e to the power minus infinity and uh, e to the power minus infinity is zero right it is the same as one divided by e to the power of infinity. Uh, of course, we should define it with limits. I'm just uh, uh, skipping this part. It should be defined not as e to the power minus infinity, but e to the power a as a goes to infinity. But I think you understand my idea. So 
the upper limit here is zero. The lower limit is x to the power uh, x of zero. So initial x. Right. Now let us consider what happens uh, here. That is even more interesting. And the reason it is even more interesting is because um, you, you can see that uh, this expression here is just a Laplace transform over x. So it's Laplace transform of x. Um, what x is, we don't know. It is some function of time. But uh, we could write it uh, using shorthand notation, Laplace transform of x. Here we had a shorthand notation, Laplace transform of dx dt. So this is a Laplace transform of x. And uh, that is it, uh, equation five, that's uh, what it gives us, Laplace transform of x. Now, what we found is uh, Laplace transform of a derivative is equal to minus x of zero plus s times Laplace transform of x. Okay. Now, we can do something with it. We can assume that x of zero is equal to zero. That is a standard assumption in all Laplace uh, theory. In fact, when you deal with Laplace theory, this is an implicit assumption. You always assume that x of zero is equal to zero. Uh, absolutely standard. Okay. Uh, that is a limitation. If you are interested in uh, initial conditions other than zero, you are in the bad luck. Uh, Laplace transform doesn't like it. But um, if you're not, then okay, good enough assumption. And then what happens is L of x is equal to um, image of x. Image is a Laplace transform, a transform of a function. You have a function of time, its image will be a Laplace uh, function. Right? We usually do not images with capital letters, uh, not bold, just normal, uh, normal capital letters, okay. italic. And uh, uh, so what we have is uh, this relation. Um, right? well, okay, Laplace so transform of x is equal to s capital. And with that, we can define a derivative operator. Derivative operator. That says Laplace transform of a derivative, or a time derivative, is equal to s times z, one second. s times Laplace transform of the original function, or simply s times uh, x of s. So to make it simpler, the same. If we have a derivative, it is the same as s multiplying by s the uh, image of the function. So without without derivative, image of the function would be x. With the derivative, it is s times x. Okay. Let me write it down for you. Okay. Last transform of x will be equal to x of s. Laplace transform of dx dt is equal to s times x of s. Okay. Any questions about this? Moving forward, well, uh, consider uh, like if a couple of examples of ODEs. So first, um, ODE here with u as input. So u is just some kind of function of time. Okay, we can find the Laplace transform of this equation, and uh, it would look like this. So on the right, we'd have as u of s, so just Laplace transform of u. We don't know what it is, it is just something. Then here, let me use uh, arrows. Here, b times u, or times y, sorry, become b times y of s, so Laplace transform of y. Here, a times uh, y dot becomes a times s times y of s. Here, y double dot becomes s squared 
times y of s. So double derivative becomes a s squared. If you want to prove this, it is quite easy. You can easily do it. You can easily do it. Uh, you could, can just define a new function, which would be equal to, let's say, g equals to dx dt. You prove that the uh, Laplace transform of g is s times image of g, but image of g is s times x. So that's how you get x squared. OK. Now uh, comes uh, some kind of magic. You take this uh, expression on the right. Right. It's Laplace images of uh, the function. You have this uh, on the left, on the right, right? On the left, uh, you have y's. On the right, you have u. You can collect all the y's on the left-hand side and put everything else on the right-hand side. So those s, um, s squared, a, s, b, uh, all go to, like, you, you, you take u, uh, y out of the brackets and then you divide by them. Okay, so we get this expression nine. Now expression nine uh, for you might look a little bit crazy. It might look a little bit crazy because if you think of S squared as A S B as uh, some kind of um, derivative operators, if you think of them as uh, representing um, uh, differentiation, then this st stops making any sense for you, right? Mathematically speaking. But uh, it is just a variable. S is just a variable. It is simply a complex number. Um, so uh, mathematically, it makes perfect sense. Now, we call this transfer function. The, what you just saw is a transfer function. Right? Um, well, let me give you two perspectives of, of how to think about uh, Three perspectives of how to think about it. Okay. Hope I will not overhelm you. First, look at this expression. What you can see here is roughly speaking a recipe. Given a signal u, how do you get a signal y? Okay, u is image, so it is uh, in the Laplace variables. You have to multiply it by this fraction to get the output y. Okay, that is the one way to look about it. Is a recipe of how to get y given u. Okay. Another way to think about it. You have this expression of y given u. You can transform it back into this form, uh, in the form 8. And then you can uh, transform it back into the form 7. So 9 is somehow implicit uh, instruction of how to get back original d. So that is the second uh, way to think about it. Right? The second way to think about it. Just a recipe of how to get your original d back is just encoded in this very complicated form. And a last uh, last way to think about it. So this transfer function uh, that I uh, shown in red is somehow a generalization of a derivative. Normal derivative uh, in this form, if you had just one derivative, would look like this, one over s. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, derivative is just s, so not even one over s. It is just s. Right? Integral is one over s. So what we have here is some kind of a more complicated way of taking derivatives in integrals. Uh, it allows you to not uh, integrate and differentiate just like one variable, but uh, to say that oh okay, there is a component uh, that had two differentiation. Here is one and times a constant. Here is zero. So it's a more general way of doing it, doing the derivatives and integrals. In fact, this is very close to what actually happens. It kind of tells you, okay, solve equation of this type. Uh, that is pretty much how you can think about it. Equation nine kind of tells you solve equation of this type, which would require, roughly speaking, two integrations. That's what uh, what this what this uh, equation nine tells you. Okay. Do two integrations. So is a generalization of the concept of a derivative. Any questions so far? I'm sorry if I went a little bit fast. OK, no question. And I'll move on.
Uh, let's just consider just a couple examples of how to, to do this. So consider ODE of this type. 2y triple dot plus y, uh, 5y dot minus 14y equals to 10u. So transfer function for this uh, would look like 10 goes uh, here, right? There will be, let me, I will, for this one, I will write it out completely. So it'll be 2 times s to the power of 3 times y of s plus 5s y of s plus uh, sorry, minus 40 y of s equals to 10 u of s. Okay. Okay. So you can see the 10 will go upstairs while everything else uh, will go downstairs. So 2 times s cubed here, 5 times s here, minus 40 here. Okay. Let's just do another one, but now much quicker. So 2 u dot minus 4, 2 y dot minus 4 y equals to u. The transfer function is 1 in the uh, numerator and 2 s minus 4 in denominator. 2 s because of 2 and uh, the first derivative minus 4 because 0 derivative times minus 4. Right? Okay. Last example, 3y triple dot plus 4y equals to u. So again, uh, numerator is 1 because 1 here. 2s cubed, or oh, sorry, it should be 3s cubed, right? Because 3x uh, is 3y triple dot plus 4y. So it gives us 4. Because zero derivative, so s uh, to the power of zero. And that's it. So that is how you get transfer functions. I, I think the process is almost mechanical. It is very hard to uh, make mistakes here. Any question about this process? Okay. Now, uh, it is not just, uh, just this, um, how should I put it, this simple um, uh, type of equations that you can transform. You can do it with a much more uh, strange equations. So consider this one. 2y double dot plus 3y dot plus 2y equals to 10 u dot minus u. So you haven't seen it before, but u can be differentiated. Why not? You have input signal, you can differentiate it. No one stops you. What does it mean particularly? Yeah, like you can think about it. It is interesting, but uh, you know, it's a legitimate, uh, legitimate way of doing it. Now, what you can do is uh, transform both sides to Laplace domain. So 2s squared, this is this guy, 3s. 3s, this is this guy. 2, this is this guy. And that is left hand side, right hand side. 10s and minus 1. Now you can uh, take y out of the brackets. You get this on the left hand side, this on the right hand side. And you can again um, isolate y on the left hand side. And you get now this fraction. 10s minus 1 divided by 2s squared plus 3s plus 2. Now, this transfer function has both numerator and denominator, and both of them contain s. This is quite normal. And uh, this shows you that transfer function can encode more than simple uh, ordinary differential equations. 
In fact, this type of Lorentzian differential equations, uh, you can think of it as a more general type uh, compared to the one that only has u, doesn't have u derivative. Why? If you think of uh, the equation, the variable y as output, remember we like to think of y uh, in the context of state space. We like to think of y in this way. Y is equal to cx and uh, dx dt is equal to ax uh, plus bu, right? That's what we like. So uh, here in this context, uh, y uh, can be anything, right? But um, for u uh, to have no derivatives, y has to be something very specific. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but um, basically, if if you want an example of when this uh, schema um, that I outlined presents you e equation which would be difficult to describe as ODE uh, without taking u derivative, I will consider, for example, uh, uh, like equation describing uh, pendulum or uh, spring mass damper, but as an output, as a y, take velocity, not position, velocity. Okay, Take velocity as a position, as a uh, argument, as an output argument. And then see if you can uh, write it as an ODE with y as a variable, and see if you can uh, write it without take, uh, having u dot anywhere. OK, OK. But if you allow u dot, it becomes more general. In fact, uh, for transfer functions, this is quite natural. Uh, this is what uh, it's going to look like. We often think of num numerator of um, the transfer function as having to do with input signal, right? It uh, describes your stability of the input signal, where denominator describes stability of the system itself. And it makes sense. If we think of Lyapunov stability for this equation, for example, we are going to only think about the left-hand side. Uh, Right-hand side, what it does, it, it is not no concern for Lyapunov stability because it uh, Lyapunov stability is only defined well for autonomous systems. This is not autonomous, so this part will have to get rid of it anyway. Right? So uh, denominator is somehow talks about stability of the system. Numerator talks about the effects of the input signal. Right, any questions about that? Any questions about that? Okay. Now, uh, here is another interesting example. Consider a what we call proportional differential control law. We haven't studied it, but uh, you uh, will see it a plenty of times in any practical course on uh, mechatronics, so on uh, introduction to robotics, almost anywhere. It is a control law where u is equal to a proportional, is proportional to uh, some kind of variable, right? Um, like variable y in this case. And it is proportional to its derivative as well. So it is kp proportional coefficient times y uh, minus kd times y dot. On practical sessions, you may, you may see it. Right. So this can be also transformed uh, into Laplace transformation of this becomes y, u of s is equal to minus kd s plus kp times the y signal. So you see it is uh, uh, quite quite interesting because you uh, have this very compact way of describing uh, differentiation. Like in this case, you know that KD times S means that uh, the signal is going to be differentiated before multiplying by constant KD. Mm -hmm. Very compact. Okay. All right. Now, uh, there is a very nice way to go from state space to transfer functions, from state space to transfer functions. The way is as following. So let us consider this, this general state space form. Notice that we even have this component d times u uh, in the downstairs. So for us, usually y is equal to cx. But in general, we can imagine y is equal to cx plus du. 
in this case, I'll uh, use it just because it is very easy. It doesn't make solution uh, worse. So it's quite easy. So that's why I'm going to use it. So how do we rewrite it in terms of Laplace transform? Well, first of all, we have a derivative here. So clearly, uh, it will become uh, something like this. So let's have S times I, I is identity matrix, right? uh, times X. Uh, all the Xs in the 17 and all the Us are now functions of S. So they are now uh, Laplace transforms. Okay, so this one on and only derivative expels uh, this uh, variable s. Everything else uh, structurally remains the same. Now what we can do is we can bring this i s, uh, sorry, s i and a to the left hand side as we did here. And we can take them out of the brackets right, like this. And then we can multiply by, uh, this guy should be invertible. We can multiply by it uh, the BU, and thus we get expression for X. Right? We multiply both sides by S I minus A inverse, and we get uh, expression for X. Why should S I minus A be invertible? <clears throat> Why should it be invertible? Okay, can does someone want to guess? Does someone want to guess? Oh, in fact, uh, this sh should remind you very much of um, uh, expression for how to compute eigenvalues, right? Should remind you very much of how to compute expression for eigenvalues. For eigenvalues, you remember what we do is we compute it as m v equals to um, uh, how do we define eigenvalue? Let's say s v, right? where s is eigenvalue. So how how do we compute that? We say m minus i s. Okay, S i. Let's uh, keep it like this. Times v is equal to zero, right? And then you uh, require that derivative uh, uh, determinant of m minus S i is equal to zero, right? That is the first step of computing eigenvalues. Then you have this characteristic polynomial, and uh, you find its roots. So unless S is eigenvalue of um, this matrix A, uh, it's not going to, the, this uh, matrix SI minus A will not have degenerate uh, determinant, so it will be invertible. Only if S happens to be eigenvalue of A, only then uh, it will be, be not invertible, right? Okay. Now we have, is there a question? Okay. Um, so we have this expression for X. We substitute it here, we substitute it here. And what we get is S times uh, this inverse matrix times B. And plus we have this D here, which goes here. And we take U out of the brackets. Mm -hmm. This, this u here, this u here. We we'll take it out of the brackets. Okay, so we have this uh, y equals to s times, uh, sorry, y equals to c times s i minus a inverse b plus d u. Of course, if we uh, had a no d case, so we didn't have this strange D matrix. It would have been even simpler. Let me show you. So we get rid of this guy. So we get rid of this guy here. And see how nice uh, expression looks now. It is just um, C S I minus A inverse B times U. Okay. Very simple. 
And that is expression for Laplace transform from U to S. So this function that uh, in 18 will be your Laplace transform. So from state space to Laplace transform, it is very easy to go. Now, from there to OD, it is also quite easy to go uh, from uh, Laplace transform to OD. Remember, you could always uh, just take this values, go from expression nine to expression eight, go from expression eight to expression seven, and you are good. The only problem is that sometimes you'll get expressions like 10, you know? Sometimes you would have um, fractions, not only in denominator, like not only denominator, you would also have a numerator and your OD would be look like 10, okay? So it's not super easy to get it into the nice form like seven, but uh, in the form like 10, it's very easy. So you here you would naturally have a fraction and then you transform it to OD. So if you wanted to go from state space to OD, you can always go first to Laplace transform plus transfer function and then to OD. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. Now, for um, our uh, purposes, we now have three different uh, ways to represent uh, a um, dynamic system. We can write it as OD. We can write it as a state space. And we can write it as Laplace transform. Right? So OD, state space, Laplace transform. So transfer function. Uh, quite often, we don't particularly want to talk about um, what representation we use because they are equivalent representation of the same system. So it's not always that we want to write um, something like this or something like this, especially if we are not intending to use it, right? So often what we say is, um, let's talk about the system G, uh, calligraphic G, okay? This calligraphic G, uh, basically means a system which is represented somehow. You are not, we're not talking about if it is represented as Laplace transform or if it is represented as a state space or as OD, it's just a system, okay? And uh, this is quite convenient. Often enough, we talk about system as having input. So U, right? U, U, as, as having output. So output in this case, Y, Y, Y. So uh, systems would often be thought of as having input and having output. But in which form we represent those is uh, uh, our decision and we don't have to specify it. Okay, so that is uh, where we start to see the idea of a system. Okay. Now, Consider a system represented now in a Laplace transform way, like using a transfer function, which is g of x times u g of s times u of s is equal to y of s. Okay. Now uh, let's say that we have a control law in time time domain, which looks like this u is equal to proportional coefficient times v minus uh, uh, y, v minus y, and derivative coefficient v dot minus y dot, okay? Where v is a reference, a reference signal, okay? We already saw it before. Now let's take Laplace transform of this, and what, what happens is we get kp plus kds, that is our coefficients here. Let me mark them out. Times Vs minus Ys, right? 
Notice how nice it is in Laplace transform. We can take the derivatives out of the brackets. That is a very nice uh, way of doing it. You cannot do it uh, normally, but uh, here you can. Now we define kp plus kds as a controller h, controller h. And uh, what we now what now we can do is we can look at the system. We know that u is equal to hs, right? Times v minus uh, y. So we can substitute it here instead of u. Uh, so let me let me do it very carefully. So y, this y, okay. Is equal to uh, g of s, same g of s as here, times I will use different color, u of s, which is equal to this whole thing, which is the same as this whole thing, where specifically this part is this part, this part. Is this right? So you see what happened. The equation 24 is just uh, our original system where we substitute the equation 23 and uh, defined controller as I defined it uh, on the line above. Okay. Uh, now, from now, yes, that was the question. There's a question, uh, uh, go ahead, ask. Okay. Maybe they just, oops. Oops, oops, oops. Sorry, uh, accidentally stopped the sharing. Uh, you, you, you can see the screen now, right? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, sorry about that. All right. Okay, now equation 25. Uh, what can we do with equation 25? No, uh, sorry, uh, equation 24, we need to transform it to 25. Well, all we do is we just open brackets. Okay, this is uh, quite simple. We just open the brackets uh, here. So, like this and this, it's just, uh, we just open the brackets and we put Y in front. Okay. Now, next step, what is the next step? We uh, take this uh, part on the right, like this part, and we transfer it here, and we take y out of the brackets again. So we have one plus gh, gh, and uh, all of this multiplied by y. The left hand, uh, the, that's the left hand side. The right hand side remains the same. And then finally, finally, we can uh, take this whole thing, put it uh, into denominator, and numerator remains uh, as before. Okay. Okay. So that's it. That's it. Now, notice what we found is how the transfer function will look like when we substitute control law into it. Let me make two observations. One observation. It is perfectly legit operation. All of those G of S, H of S, et cetera, are just fractions. You can do all those operations with fractions. They are quite simple and uh, would result in new fractions. It's not going to result in some unusual objects that you don't know how to handle, just fractions. Uh, second, this was possible only because we had a reference signal V of T. If we didn't have a reference signal V of T, on this step, we wouldn't have this expression. We only have would only have y, and uh, then on this step, we wouldn't have v. We only have y, and on this step, finally, 
we would not have the right hand side at all. And transfer function, by definition, is a function that transfers one signal into another. It is not a function that can operate on one signal alone. You need to have two signals. So uh, control reference is uh, important. If you're going to do all of this by yourself, remember you need the control reference. Basically, the whole idea of Laplace transforms is how you track a given input signal, how to react to a given input signal. It is not about um, uh, like Lepunov style discussions of how one signal dies down or how it converges and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, reference signal is uh, critically important here. Now, what I wrote here is one of the ways to find what we call a closed loop system. What do you mean by closed loop? Well, notice this control law depends on the reference, but also on the on the output signal itself. So the output becomes part of the input. When we substitute a control law that takes your output as input back into your system, you close the loop, right? System outputs something, you input it into controller, controller input into the system, closed loop. Okay, so this is called a closed loop representation. Okay, this is one of the ways to do it. Let me show you in another way. Let me show you another way. Now, imagine we have a reference signal that looks like this. R of t is equal to kp v of t plus kd v dot of t. Notice here we don't have a separate um, separate, uh, uh, how should I put it? Why? What, what, okay, what we have here is just a, a description of a reference signal. Okay. It, it is the uh, same reference uh, basically as we had before. So we just define it as uh, R of T. Okay. Now, the same control law as before would look then like minus kp y minus kd y dot, so same as before, plus r of t. So if we exp express out what r of t is, if we substitute 28 into 29, what we get is uh, original control law. So we didn't invent anything new. It's just a new way to describe the same thing. But now let's do Laplace transform over 29. So let's transform this. So we have u of s, Kpy uh, of s kd uh, y uh, kd s y of s. This is essentially the same as h of s times y of s, right? This part, like this part, basically is transformed into this. Okay. And then instead of uh, instead of actually transforming components of the reference signal. We just transform the whole reference signal itself. Okay. We simply transform transform the whole thing. We just say, okay, this is R of S. What R of S looks like, that is uh, neither here nor there. It's just R of S. Okay. And then uh, closed loop uh, looks like this. We substitute U of S into our system. What we get is this part, H times Y from here is a minus sign. Plus g times times r, which is uh, from here. I will just show you connections. So this comes from here. This comes from here. Okay. Then we bring everything that contains y to the left hand side. Uh, I will use a different color. So basically, we bring this to the right hand side. And then we divide by the resulting uh, right hand side uh, part. So one plus G times H. And now we have a transfer function that looks different. If you are uh, observant, you may notice that the only difference is that here in the upstairs in the numerator, we only have G instead of HG as previously. Previously we had HG, okay, HG. Now we only have G. J H okay now we only J, but of course V uh, and R are related how well R 
uh, is equal to H V. So if we replace R with H V, we would have again G H uh, divided by one plus G H. So it will be the same as here. Okay, uh, all of this is very nice. And uh, there is a reason why we uh, like this description. The reason is because this guy is a classic description of the closed loop system. And uh, especially this is important because this downstairs equation, one plus GH, is going to be key to analyzing stability of a controller. Um, you can already kind of guess that it shouldn't be equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, then we have a problem. And uh, indeed, this is what we are going to see later on. Like the controller should not allow the system to have zero in this uh, denominator. Right. I think. Um, okay, we are not uh, we, we are not out of time yet. Right, we have plenty of time. If I uh, understand correctly, let me see. Let me double check. Yeah, we have plenty of time. Good. Maybe you're doing too much because I think uh, we're almost done. Okay. Now, one, I think, uh, last thing that I want to show you uh, for uh, this topic is this. If G, system G is stable, okay, uh, well, here is the, you can see how nice it is to be using the language of systems. We don't need to say equation is stable, state space equation is stable, just the system is stable. Okay. If we give it a constant input u0, its output will approach some constant value y0, right? Makes sense, right? You give it a constant input, uh, transient process will go away, but uh, the output is not going to be zero. Output is going to be something. Okay, so this pair is called a steady state solution. So given a constant input y, uh, u, you get a constant output y, steady state solution. So after the transient process is over, after the influence of initial conditions is over. Initial conditions, uh, I will re repeat it a few times more during the course, but it so bears me. Initial condition is a stuff that has to do with Lyapunov thinking. It is uh, talking about transient process. Initial conditions, what we care about uh, when we think about initial conditions is if from a given initial condition, we will converge to zero or to some number, right? The transfer functions do not care about initial conditions. They care about signals, how the signals are transformed, okay? So here, uh, what we care about with steady state solution is not the initial conditions, in fact, we hope that they will die off because the system is stable. We care about some kind of um, constant value of y of uh, zero, which should not depend on initial conditions. Remember, if we had, if, if this value y of zero depended on initial conditions, what it would mean is that uh, a small change in initial conditions uh, make signal converge to a different point which implies we don't have asymptotic stability. So if system G was asymptotically stable, a small change in initial conditions would not result in a difference in to where the system converges. Therefore, uh, Y zero should not be a function of initial conditions. Okay. That is an interesting way of uh, thinking about it. Now, we can find the ratio between U of uh, zero and uh, y of zero, right? If they are scalars, it should be quite easy. This is called a steady state gain. This is called a steady state gain. So how the system multiplies the input, okay? So let us represent system G as a transfer function. So this is a standard way to write transfer functions. Uh, we say, okay, in the numerator, we have BM, SM, S to the power of M, plus b m minus one, s to the power m minus one, all the way to b one. And uh, in the denominator, we have a n s to the power n plus a n minus one, s to the power n minus one, all the way to a one. Okay. Now, if 
if um, the both u and y are at steady state, right, then it means that they, the derivatives are equal to zero. Steady state means uh, like they're constant, basically. They don't no longer change. So the graph looks like this horizontal line. This is a graph for y. This is a graph for u. They should be horizontal lines. Okay. That means their derivatives are equal to zero. Well, if you think of S as differential operator, which you can if you uh, if you multiply by denominator, both sides, it will just <coughs> essentially become derivatives. Then uh, every part which contains S uh, would, uh, would multi multiply U or Y become zero because uh, derivative of a constant is zero. So this will become zero. Anything else here will become zero. This will become zero. Everything else here will become zero. The only thing that would not become zero is B1 and A1, because they represent um, just constant multiplications. So in fact, uh, from this along, you can see that uh, steady state gain is going to be equal to B1 divided by A1. Or, uh, which is kind of interesting, if you are willing to write transfer function as y equals to y of s, so y of s equals to on, uh, w of s times u of s, then you can say the steady state gain k is equal to y of zero, uh, w of zero, sorry. So uh, evaluating transfer function at zero, at uh, s equal to zero, gives you a steady state gain. Now, this may not sound very interesting, but imagine if your input is voltage okay, to your motor. You want to know what speed you're going to have for this voltage. Well, after after the all the initial you know, uh, increase of speed is out, you just have a steady state solution. What is going to be the speed? Well, multiply voltage by k. That's what you're going to have. Another example, let's say you have not one motor, but you have a whole car. And you somehow could uh, write it as a linear system. Let's say while it goes forward, you can write it as a linear system. You, you don't have just one motor. Let's say for simplicity, it is electric car. You don't have one motor, you have a transmission. You have all kinds of uh, linear damping coefficients, so uh, viscous friction, etc. All of this stuff. And uh, you want to know what is going to be the cruise velocity of the car given a certain voltage applied to the motor. Now, uh, the right answer function, evaluate at zero, you're going to get your speed, uh, your gain, like how much, is, what's the relation between those two. As long as the car is linear, uh, this is going to work. So uh, for, as soon as you can write something as a linear system, you can easily evaluate um, at steady state how the how would the input signal be multiplied uh, to get the output. That's quite interesting. And that is, of course, one of many many things you can do with uh, with uh, transfer functions and uh, other things. If you want uh, as exercise, you can try to do the same, but with uh, state space representation. Like you have constant input v. A, uh, u, you have constant output y, what will be the ratio between them, uh, but uh, do it with, uh, through state space. Interesting, uh, interesting exercise. Okay. All right. So, uh, as I said, this uh, topic is quite extensive. So, here are just some additional materials that you can try to follow. Those are uh, second and third link uh, YouTube uh, lectures. Uh, link six is a textbook. So you can uh, try to look at them. And uh, next lecture, what we're going to focus on is a very big application of uh, transfer functions. The application will be frequency analysis. We're going to do uh, what we call body plot. In fact, it is a way to analyze how different frequencies of your signal influence your behavior of your system and uh, uh, to understand if 
all the frequencies are allowed. This is something that uh, is beyond uh, stability as explained by Lyapunov. So it is the expansion. And in fact, uh, this is something that is pretty difficult to do in any other way other than through transfer functions. So it's quite important for you uh, to know. Right. Uh, I'll stop the recording and to ask questions if you have them.